who may be wondering. Go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And there we go. 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to be in verses 3 through 16. Frank read uh, up until verse 8. We're going to continue this series called Blueprints. Where we looked at the, the biblical foundations of a healthy church from 1 Timothy. We've made it to the portion that's devoted to how we minister to each other. How we minister to each other in the church, how we minister to each other in the community. Last week we looked and saw plainly that our first ministry to each other is to relate to and love each other like family. To hold each other accountable like family. To, to rebuke each other when, we're, when another person is wrong or has fallen into sin. The same way we would do with someone we love dearly. Not punitively, not to harm them, but to correct them in love. The family is important. And that's sort of the, 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 the most common um, metaphor used for the life of the church in this letter. From the Apostle Paul to the young pastor Timothy serving in Ephesus. Now, the comfort level that we have with family is not always the same as it is with strangers or even close acquaintances. Depending on your family, sometimes you're, you would prefer the company of strangers. Sometimes the company of strangers freaks people out. Here's what I mean. Suppose that you're having a 4th of July barbecue. And uh, you've got your, your brother there and your sister there and there's all these relatives and people are there and they're, they're eating food and they're moving around and then some guy you don't know opens your fridge, takes out a Pepsi, grabs a bag of chips off the counter, sits on your chair and starts eating. Is that weird? Yeah. You don't know him. You don't know the color of his truck. You don't know his first name. You don't know anything about him. It's weird. He's a stranger, yet he's there acting like Family, that's odd. Now, some of you are like, no, it's not weird. I wouldn't be too worked up about that. Maybe you're just super, super welcoming. But you definitely can understand that there is a difference between your brother going into your refrigerator and some stranger that you don't know. There's a difference in those things. And our comfort level with those things is different. So what about the household of God, as First Timothy calls the church? How do we go about knowing how or uh, who to allow access to the resources of the church. I'm not talking about attending a worship service. That's open to everybody. But what's our responsibility to each other in providing for the needs of others in the life of the church? Now, I'll admit on the front end, this is a difficult passage, not because it's difficult to understand. It's really straightforward. It's difficult because it's hard to apply. And perhaps that's the cultural expectation that the church will help anyone and everyone in any situation. And perhaps it's the pressure that I put on myself or feel upon me to be generous and to feed and lodge anybody that might have a need to be hospitable. I'm not sure. I think this is a difficult passage because applying it forces us to do one of two things, both of which can make us uncomfortable. One, it forces us to sacrifice for the needs of somebody else. That can be uncomfortable. Or two, it can force us to say no to somebody who expresses a need. Now, one of those probably makes you uncomfortable depending on the scenario. Maybe both of them do all of the time. But that's what we find in the passage. So if you are comfortable being uncomfortable, you'll be very comfortable this morning. <laughs> what we're talking about is our ministry to the least of these. To people that have need. But how do we sort that out? Ministry to the least of these is spoken of directly by Jesus in Matthew 25, 37 through 46. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and so much... As you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. 
I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, and so much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Is this ministry to the least of these something to be taken seriously according to Jesus? Absolutely. But then we find passages in Scripture like 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. So where is the line? Where is the balance? How do we maintain this ministry of benevolence to those who have a legitimate need while honoring the clear teaching of Scripture that those who are unwilling to work shouldn't be offered food? How do we know when to help and when to say no? What as a church are we biblically required to do and what is optional? This is what our text this morning deals with. These answers are provided for us in principles that we can glean from what the Apostle Paul writes about a specific situation going on in the church at Ephesus. So let's see this, this widow care program that Frank read about a moment ago. Let's see what we read in this text as our case study. We're not in Ephesus. We're not dealing with those specific people. We aren't going to apply all of those things on a one-to-one -one basis, but we can glean principles to apply in 2021 in Northern California that we can use as a guide. So let's go through this case study and see if we can't build a checklist for ourselves to get this right. Because according to Jesus, it's very, very important. That's what we're doing this morning. Sound good? Are we ready? All right. In the ancient world, a widow was the most helpless of all people. A woman didn't receive an inheritance in most cases. It would almost, all of it, in, in all cases, would go entirely to the children when the husband died. So apart from the generosity of her family or her surviving children, a widow would be completely desolate. So if anybody is the least of these, if we want to make our case study about anybody in, in, in the first century culture, it would be widows. Remember, this immediately follows this command to treat older men like fathers and younger men like brothers and older women like mothers. So if you have a widow in your church and she's hungry and you turn her away, that's turning away your own mother who's hungry. That's what we should understand when we put this in context. This is why the widows in Ephesus, they really are the perfect case study. They would be the most needy, the most uh, desolate, the most um, the most destitute. And the reality is, is these widows, they represent all of us spiritually apart from Christ. We're that morally bankrupt. We have nothing that we can offer the Lord on our own. We are completely and utterly dependent on the kindness of somebody else. The case with our souls, that somebody else who meets our need is Jesus. When he dies in our place and restores our soul, it meets our greatest need. But in terms of physical need, we get to see here who to help and how, when to say no. So the first principle that we see in verses 3 through 6 is, is the need genuine? Is the need genuine? Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their, repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now, if she who is really a widow and left alone 
trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. Paul says, honor widows who are really widows. Now, again, context is important. We just read in verse 5, and you, you, you might think that we're obligated only to, the help, to help these devout Christian widows who pray all day and night, but if we put this in context, he says in verse 3, honor widows who are truly widows, and he's perhaps anticipating the question that Timothy might ask, how can someone be a widow without being a widow? And maybe you're wondering that. He goes, honor widows who are truly widows. Well, how do I know who's a widow and who's not? I mean, isn't a widow, that's like a pretty straightforward definition. Did her husband die? Then she's a widow, right? But he says it's not that straightforward, not in the fact that she's a widow, but in, in, in when the church should come alongside and help and meet that need. So fair question. When is a widow not a widow? And Paul clarifies that in verses 5 through 6. He says, look, in order for someone to be put into this program where the church is meeting their needs, she needs to be really a widow, not taking away the pain and the loss and the grief that she's experiencing over the loss of her husband, but if she's got surviving children, if she's got resources, she doesn't need to be in this program where the church is paying her way and meeting her needs. She doesn't have a genuine need. So just because someone has the circumstances that you could describe as genuinely needful doesn't necessarily mean they are. It says, not everyone who's lost a husband has the same need. Not everyone is in that same set of circumstances. So verses 5 through 6 is not about we're going to help people when they, when they are faithful and when they pray and when they do all this stuff. It's a tale of two widows. The widow in verse 5 has no options. She has no resources. She has no family to help her. Where she's at is simply to pray day and night and trust God. That's her only option. The widow in verse 6 has options. She's living in pleasure. She's living in luxury. Yes, she's a widow. But she's not destitute. So this is a contrast between two types of requests. One comes to the church as a widow who genu genuinely has no alternative but to pray and hope that God will provide. The other in verse 6 comes not with a genuine need, but with the same claim. Why? So that she can continue to live in pleasure. The widow in verse 5 comes for her need. The widow in verse 6 comes for her greed. And in case you think Paul is being hard on the widow in verse 6 by saying, she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives? Let me ask this question. Can you think of anything more shameful than someone taking resources set apart for the most destitute people so that they can continue to live in luxury? Is there anything more shameful than that? To fraudulently claim that there's a need to finance fun. That is the fruit of a spiritually dead person. Imagine asking the church for aid under the auspice of being destitute and then turning around and using those resources to, to pay for pleasure. The Bible says that that's evidence of a person who's not alive spiritually. Yeah, they're alive physically, but spiritually they're dead. So we have no obligation as a church to those without a genuine need. But to widows who are really widows, to those with a genuine need, we have a God-given responsibility to serve and minister to them because they are the least of these. They are really without options. Now, I, I want to I make something clear here. This is important. I don't say this from on high or as somebody raised with a silver spoon. I say this as somebody who has known genuine need. Cynthia and I both grew up in, in relative poverty by American standards. Both of us were raised in single-parent homes by moms who worked three jobs to keep us fed. And I mean, despite some really tough odds, they did a fantastic job. And I'm so thankful for both of those women. But Cynthia was raised in the city. And I was raised 
in the country. And so we've sort of developed a little bit of an inside joke about the differences of being city poor versus country poor. You guys know what I'm talking about? Country poor people say stuff like this. We were so poor we couldn't afford to pay attention. When you're country poor, you need to change the TV channel. You have to walk half a mile and look in a different neighbor's window. Okay, we didn't quite have it that bad. But true story, I did have to go on the roof and turn the TV antenna to change the channel. That's legitimate. On the other hand, Cynthia grew up in the city. City poor is a little bit different. City poor people say things like this. We were so poor, we would ask the neighbor to borrow a butter knife, but we always wanted them to leave a little butter on it. <laughs> For me, growing up, the need was genuine. My father left my mother with four kids and the debt of a failed business, and it was rough. And I remember one Christmas when our church brought presents for all of us kids because there was nothing else. There were times when there wasn't enough food in the house, and we had no, other, no alternatives but to pray and trust God, but somehow the Lord always and inevitably faithfully provided, but we learned to trust God. And somebody would show up and the need would be met. So this concern for the less fortunate is something that resonates in my soul. This is also something that is an attribute of the church throughout the ages, even into the Old Testament. Throughout the Old Testament, the Lord has instructed the people of God to care for widows, again, for example. In fact, it grieves the Lord, as we see in Malachi 3, verse 5, when people are exploited and turned away when they have a genuine need. Malachi 3, verse 5, And I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me. God comes with judgment for those who exploit the needy, who have resources to help and turn them away. Deuteronomy 14, verse 29, we, we see God establish laws for the nation of Israel to make sure that those without means were provided for. And the Levite, because he has no portion, no inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. So it only makes sense that the New Testament church, standing on that foundation, would also be compassionate and charitable to the needs of others. However, the church has got to be careful to be good stewards. We have to be good stewards of our resources and not waste them on illegitimate needs. Still, this is the need genuine isn't the only item on our checklist. Even when the need is legitimate, there may be other options rather than the church just paying the bill or meeting the need. And we would be wise to consider those other options. And that's the question that comes out of verses 7 through, 20, 7 through 10. Are there alternatives? It says this. And these things command that they may be blameless, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. So are, are there alternatives, yes or no? Remember the widow in verse 5. She's left alone. She has no children. She has no one to care for her. She has no grandchildren. Before the church steps up and meets the need, it should consider whether or not somebody else should meet the need. Whether that somebody else is able to meet the need. Maybe there is nobody else. Verse 8 is key here. If anyone does not provide for his own, Especially of his own household, he has denied the faith 
and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, typically we apply this to the epidemic of fathers who neglect to care for their own children. That's where we typically find verse 8. We, we typically think of it in those terms of men who refuse to work and to make sure that their children are adequately clothed or sheltered or fed. And, and yes, that's absolutely included there. And I grew up in that environment. And the church stepped in and helped. But that this verse 8 is not exclusive to fathers. It's in the context of widows. This is in the context of the physical... Family. It could be aging parents, it could be grandparents, it could be a brother or a sister who's fallen on hard times. And certainly there's a time to say no as not to enable that brother or sister to live in a way that is continually detrimental to themselves. But absolutely, we have a responsibility to those in our own physical family to make sure their needs are met. It's really, really plain. If anyone does not provide for his own, especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So as a church, we should encourage, before stepping in and being the, 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 the organization meeting the need, we should encourage whatever reconciliation or work or healing that needs to take place in the family so that the family, the physical family, can do what God's designed it to do. We should be encouraging that. We should be wanting to see that take place. And if we jump in and we meet the need without looking at that item on the checklist, then we're actually getting in the way of some of these things that the Lord uses to strengthen and heal and continue healthy families. Now, I've seen that stretched too far. I've seen Christian ministries create policies where they won't help unless that person has already applied for every pertinent program at the Department of Social Services. They look for every conceivable alternative before the church will do anything or before that ministry will do anything. I don't see that in the text. What we see is, is there family that should be meeting this need? Yes or no? If there is, we should encourage that to take place. And we want to not stretch that question beyond what the scriptures give us. Otherwise, we're adding to God's word. So there's this admonition that the physical family take care of each other before the need is shared with, this, with the faith family. That's really that simple. The physical family should be encouraged to meet the need before that need is shared with the faith family. That's us. The general principle should ask, could this need be met another way? And when the need's legitimate, and there aren't other ways, there aren't alternatives among the physical family, we see the church do what Galatians 6, 9, and 10 says. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. Now, there's some more specifics to this case study. There's some other possible alternatives. There's some things that are unique to what's going on in Ephesus. We have to be mindful of our unique circumstances as well. That's important work because the resources are limited. Even in Ephesus, there's apparently more widows that are seeking aid than, than, than the church could serve. So the Apostle Paul offers a pretty innovative solution. He says in verse 9, don't let a widow under 60 be taken into the number. And unless she's been the wife of one man and is well reported for good works and she's brought up children and loved strangers, if she's washed the saints' feet and she's relieved the afflicted and diligently followed every good work, then, then she can be enrolled into this program. Remember the church's family. When the physical family can't help meet the need, the church is the next option. But Paul is clear. The limited resources of the church were first to go to the oldest among this group of widows and to those who had an established relationship and a history of faithfulness in the life of the church. And that just makes sense. Can we meet every single need for social aid in our culture? 
Us, Sony Ford Community Church, can we do that? Yeah. No. We don't have the resources. I wish we did, but we don't. We have to be, we have to be good stewards. We have to be selective in who we help. And so Paul encourages Timothy to create this policy. Okay, for your situation, you, you, you got to focus on the widows over 60. You got to focus on the ones that have been part of the life of the church and have served faithfully. You got to help them first. And right now, there's not enough for you to help others. You gotta limit it there. Apparently, that widow's ministry had some sort of formal registration. They knew who they were helping, they knew how they were helping them. But bear in mind, in the first century, fewer than 4% of women lived beyond the age of 50. So, widows who are really widows and over 60, that were established as faithful believers, they were enrolled into this care program where they were provided for out of the resources of the church. For everybody else, Paul would say, let's look for alternatives first. Let's find some other way to meet this need. If it's a widow over 60 who's been faithful in the life of the church, absolutely no questions asked. We've got to do that. But for everybody else, we've got to find some alternatives because we just can't meet all these needs. Women over 60 in the first century, really tough spot. But in the United States of America in 2021, women over 60 got quite a bit of life left, right? I mean, 60 is the new 40. Most of the people I went to school with were teenagers until they were 35. There's lots of productive years after 60. So what Paul writes isn't the way to shape this benevolent ministry. It's a way that's considered the circumstances unique to him, unique to them in Ephesus. And again, we, we ask the question, are there alternatives? And that doesn't mean we just turn people away. It's that we look for the alternatives and maybe it's helping them find a job and maybe it's helping them learn a new skill. Maybe it's helping them uh, to connect to some sort of other program that can help them to become self-sufficient. But if the need is genuine and there aren't alternatives, then the people that we interact with as a church would be in a similar set of circumstances to these widows who are really widows that we read about in 1 Timothy 5. Otherwise, we should look for what alternatives that we can come up with. So, first question, is the need genuine? Second question, are there alternatives? Look at verses 11 through 15 with me in the Bible. But refuse the younger widows, for when they have become to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. Besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, Give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some have already turned aside to Satan. Listen, there is a fine line between assisting and enabling. There's a fine line between helping and hurting. Assisting is helping. Enabling is hurting. And that's the third test. Can we help without hurting? Yes or no? First question, is the need genuine? We're looking for a yes. Second question, are there alternatives? We're looking for a no. Can we help without hurting? Has to be a yes. He says, refuse younger widows. The younger widows would technically be women under 60, I suppose, but there's no doubt that Paul is talking about women who are much, much younger. How do we know? Because he, the alternative he prescribes is, you know what they should do? They should get married and raise children. Now, even in 2021, <coughs> 59 and a half year old women, the odds of them having children, pretty low, even with all the medical technology that we have, right? So he's got in mind women who are much, much younger. Not likely 59-year-old women would bear children. And he says, look, if, if, if she were to remarry, 
that would be good. The reality is, is it would not be uncommon for men to die at a really young age too. This is a world where there's dangers in everyday travel. There's ravages of disease and war and a host of other things. Being, being a widow was much more common in this culture than it is in ours. So he says to enroll these younger widows into this ministry, women who have a lot of productive or childbearing years ahead of them, that the church might actually do more harm than good. I mean, if her needs were met and she didn't have to work and she didn't have any responsibility, where would the outlet be for that youthful exuberance? Paul says that at that stage of life, she wouldn't be satisfied with the pace and the company of these older widows in this program, and she might become a busybody or a gossip. Perhaps she may even become promiscuous. And so, Paul says, among these widows in, in Ephesus, there's even some that are turning away, turning aside, seem to have greater allegiance to Satan than they do to Jesus based on their conduct. The church taking on a need can't do more harm than good. If we, if we move past assisting into enabling, we create a greater problem than we're trying to solve. Paul says if these younger women were to work, or, you know, as he, as he writes, get married, remarry, re raise children then they'd be less likely to fall into these patterns of sinful behavior that come with idleness. Anybody here have a pickup truck? Have you ever drive a pickup truck in the ice and the snow? What do you do? How do you get that pickup truck to have better traction in the ice and in the snow? You put a couple sandbags in the back, right? Put something heavy in the bed of the truck. The reality is, is we ride a little smoother and get a little better traction when we have some weight when we have some responsibility, when we're idle, when we have no responsibility, when we have no, no weight to bear, we're kind of aimless. We, we kind of just spin our wheels and don't really gain any traction. And, and that's true for these widows, young widows in Ephesus. It's, it's true for us. People are better with responsibility. And if we remove all of the responsibility for feeding, some, for feeding yourself, we can inadvertently encourage continuing patterns of sinful behavior. And that's what we read about earlier in 2 Thessalonians. If you won't work, shouldn't eat. There's a big difference, though, between won't work and can't work, isn't there? Big difference. We're not talking about somebody who has a, a diminished physical or mental capacity who can't work. We're not talking about somebody whose circumstances are preventing them from work. We're talking about somebody who can't. They can't do the work necessary to provide for their own needs. The fact is, if we aren't encouraging people to be responsible, we're enabling them to be idle. We're enabling them to be lazy. And we fail in our discipleship because we fail to encourage them toward the spiritual maturity that we read about in Ephesians 4. We're, we're working and producing what's necessary for your own needs and more so, so that you have something to share with others that have need is admonished as a characteristic of a spiritually mature person. It says, let him who stole steal no longer. Let somebody who's using what he didn't produce stop it. But rather, let him labor, working with his own hands what is good, that he may have, may have something to give to him who has need. We have to encourage people toward this. And if we're not encouraging people toward this, we're enabling people to not do this, we fail as a church. Again, verse 15 says that those who receive help without legitimate need were turning aside to Satan. Even charitable actions, even the charitable actions of the church should spur people on toward godliness. And if our charity makes it easier for people to maintain a lifestyle of sin, it's not a blessing that we give them, but a curse. And we ought to have no part in it. Hear me in this. As a church, 
And as individual believers, we're to come alongside people who have a genuine need, but we should never subsidize sin. Is the need genuine? Yes. Are there alternatives? No. Can we help them without hurting them? Yes. Great. Three out of three so far. One more test before we go all in and do everything we can do. Can we meet the need? Can we actually do it? I mean, that's obvious, right? You can't give what you don't have. Verse 16. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them. And do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows. Can the church meet a need out of resources it doesn't have? Can you meet a need out of resources you don't have? Paul says that when the need is genuine, the church is to meet it, but the church could be burdened. It could get to the point where it doesn't have the resources to meet the need. Hear me in this. You can't bleed a turnip. And you can't pull water out of an empty well. This phrase, relieve those who are really widows, this word translated as relieve is the Greek word eparcheo. It means to give out of one's own resources. If the church doesn't have the resources because it ignores these principles, it can't give out of its own resources. So if we ignore those first three things and the resources are depleted, where will those who are truly destitute, who have no alternatives, where will they turn? Where will they go? When the need is there, when these other things check out, but the resources aren't, perhaps we join that person in prayer. I mean, the, the cold shoulder in turning someone away isn't here in the text, and that's not who we are in Christ anyway. But remember, this widow care program in Ephesus is a case study. None of these, none of these principles are limited to widows or to Ephesus, but these are things that we can apply in our lives and in our church and in our budgets. Why? Why do this at all? Why not just go, you know what, I'm going to let everybody figure it out. They'll be fine. There's a social safety net. It's America, for crying out loud. Why should we even bother to carve this out and put a line item for benevolence in our budget as a church? Why should we go out of our way to help people? Why should we make sure that the resources are set aside to be used for those who are truly destitute? Because we as believers understand what it means to be destitute. Maybe you've never been hungry a day in your life. Maybe you've never ever been broke before. But as I said in the introduction, apart from Jesus Christ, we are spiritually bankrupt and without a hope. The Bible teaches that we're all helpless. We're able to do nothing about our spiritual condition. And Jesus Christ went to the cross on our behalf. He sacrificially gave his own life to redeem us, to purchase us from the grave. And so if we find it difficult to reach deep and to meet the needs of those who are legitimately the least of these, then we need to look no further than the cross of Christ where Jesus paid the highest price to purchase our freedom from sin and death. And the reality is a greater debt than you can possibly imagine that you and I owe because of our sin was already paid for in full by Jesus Christ. He died in our place. And he calls us as believers to live as his representatives on the earth until he returns for us or calls us home. That's why. And when we love the least of these, when we love people practically as under the Lord, he receives the glory, he receives the honor, and he receives the praise through our acts of love done in his name in a world dying apart from him. That's the why. Why should we continue to be benevolent? Why should we care? Because Jesus has already done that and so much more for us. So if you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord, you don't know Christ as your Savior, hear me in this. God loves you. And maybe you need to hear that again. God loves you. Not because you're good. 
not because he needs anything from you, but in spite of the fact that you, like me, have broken his law countless times, he loves you still. He says, don't lie, we lie. He says, don't steal, we do. Yet he loves us, and he died to pay for our crimes so that we could be redeemed, and then he adopts us as his own children. And this is greater than anything anyone could ever give. He's met the greatest need that you and I could ever have. And apart from Christ, we are headed to hell. But God, who's rich in mercy, gives eternal life to those who turn from sin and trust in him. So trust in him today. See that greatest need met. Begin a new walk, a new life in Christ this morning. For those who are here as believers in Jesus, let's close with a couple points of application. In light of the fact that God has already so wonderfully modeled this idea of meeting the needs of the least of these, that's us, saving us. Let's care for those in our own house. Are there children or grandchildren or parents or grandparents whose daily needs go unmet? Perhaps there's some need for forgiveness or reconciliation that needs to happen. But Christ has modeled that too, hasn't he? Reconciling sinful people to a holy God. Perhaps this is a, a maturity issue. Maybe you've allowed others to shoulder the burden of your responsibility for too long. Today, as a believer, repent. Take steps to grow in your ability to provide for your own. But hear me, please don't read an ounce of condemnation into that. We're here to help you as a church. Come and talk with me. We, we'll do as much as we can to come alongside you and help you. But whatever it is, take steps to begin to care for those that you are responsible for, your physical family. Second, care for those of the Lord's house. As a believer, are you faithfully giving in support of the ministry of the local church? Are you actively looking for ways to minister to other people? Or are you, I mean, are, are you stepping out and serving to assist those or sitting quietly on the sidelines waiting and hoping not to be asked? As a church, we exist to glorify God and make disciples. And one of the most effective ways that we can do that is by meeting the needs of the least of these in our community. As we already read in Matthew 25, verse 40, Assuredly, I say to you, and so much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Care for those of the Lord's house. They're in help without hurting. It's really important to understand this concept of helping without hurting. Again, the line is thin between assisting and enabling. And perhaps it's helpful. Perhaps it's helpful. Maybe just a question to help guide your thinking in that. How does this way of assisting somebody point somebody to Christ? And if you can't answer that question, you're probably not really helping them. How does assisting this person in this way point them to Christ. And if you can answer it clearly, maybe you're helping them in a very, very profound way. But ultimately, if we're not, if we're not steering them toward their greatest need being met, I mean, what good? Let me ask this question. What good is offering somebody a haircut when they have a when they need a heart transplant? Not not that not that helpful, right? That's kind of what I'm getting. Does the, the assistance we offer at least point them to having that greatest need met? See, if we're meeting the needs of the body of Christ physically, right? We're meeting people's physical needs, but we're ignoring the soul, or worse, we're making it easier for that person to continue living in a pattern of sin that's destroying their life and destroying their soul, and we aren't joining God in His work. The opposite. We're tearing down what the Holy Spirit is desiring to build up. So instead, let's help without hurting. Let's spur one another on toward love and good works so that God's glorified. 
so that needs are met, but that the right needs are met. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for a passage that's very straightforward and practical, but difficult to apply because it, it moves our hands. It's not something that we can just read and, and, and digest. Oh, bless God, that was such a, such a profound truth. Thank you, Lord. It, it forces us to be your hands and feet. It also forces us to do some things that perhaps are uncomfortable and say no when it's appropriate. But God, would you give us discernment? As much as you give us a generous heart, give us a discerning heart so that we can help without hurting and represent you well. God, I pray for those here this morning perhaps that don't know you. They have a need for something far greater than we as a church could ever provide. They need the forgiveness, the redemption, and a new life in Christ that is only available through repentance and faith in your Son. Lord, right now I pray that you would do a work. They would see Jesus and his tremendous love poured out on the cross. And right now in this moment, God, repent and believe the good news that their sin can be paid for. They can have forgiveness and freedom. But not freedom to do whatever they want, but freedom to live free from their sin and to live in a way that honors your name. God, help us to be a church that gets this right in a world that so often gets it wrong. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, well... Oh.